I'm going to keep my introductory comments very brief so we can get straight into the panel, but I just wanted to say a word or two about how this panel came about. Um, basically, this panel emerged because I have a very messy desk. Um, I've been uh, accumulating all these books on Vietnam studies and Southeast Asian studies. And one day, uh, as these books are piling up on my desk, I noticed an accidental pattern pop out from the spines of the books uh, that are piled up in my quarantine office also known here in the Harms family as the dinner table. And I noticed in this pattern that I was the proud owner of three recently published books, all on the subject of militarized landscapes of the Indochina conflicts. And they were based on research in Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And I immediately wondered when I saw this pattern emerge, I wondered if the authors were in conversation with each other. Um, so then a few emails later, I wrote to the authors and I wondered if they were in conversation and they said they'd love to be. Um, so all of a sudden we had a panel and now we, here we are with a crowd. Um, actually, let me see, we have a crowd of 45 people that emerged out of just this mess on my desk. Um, so let me just take a moment to introduce the speakers. And I think just by naming them and the titles of their books, you can imagine the connections that I think will be emerging from today's discussion. First is David Biggs. He's a professor of history at UC Riverside is the author of Footprints of War, Militarized Landscapes in Vietnam, published by the University of Washington Press in 2018. The next is Jonathan Padway. He's an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. His book is called Disturbed Forest, Fragmented Memories, Jarai and Other Lives in the Cambodian Highlands, which was also published by the University of Washington Press in 2020. And we also have Leah Zani, an anthropologist, author, and poet who holds a PhD from UC Irvine and who is the author of Bomb Children, Life in the Former Battlefields of Laos, published by Duke University Press in 2019. As you can see, the titles of these books immediately form a pattern. So I won't go to any detail about what the goal of today's discussion is. Really the main goal is to bring these authors into conversation with, with each other. So the panel is designed specifically to allow the authors to engage in an open discussion. And I'll serve as the moderator, but I'm hoping that the panel will really evolve into an open discussion between the authors and all the audience members. Um, so to get us started, um, I will ask, uh, I'll start with two questions. The first question will be to ask them in five minutes or less, just to tell us as an audience, especially for those of you who haven't read the books yet, just uh, give a sense of what the books are about, what the main argument is, or any innovations they feel are in it. And then my second question after they've all talked about the kind of main project of the book will be to ask each of them to pick a kind of favorite passage of the book. One of the things that's really significant about all of these books is the way they've attended not only to the topic of militarized landscapes, but to the art and practice of writing. So I thought it'd be really great to kind of treat this a little bit like a, a mini miniature book reading as well. Um, so that will be my second question. And then after that, um, that should probably take about 30 minutes um, to do all of those. And then I'll open it up uh, to questions from uh, the open Zoom audience. Um, so let me turn to the first uh, speaker, uh, David uh, Biggs. Um, tell us, David, in five minutes or less, what is your book about and what do you see as the main argument for innovation? Well, thanks, uh, Eric, and uh, colleagues, panelists, uh, everybody for coming. Uh, it's really a pleasure to to be here in this form. It's this form is better than uh, no form at all. <laughs> and uh, Eric, I wonder if you can just um, hit play on this video, and I'll use it to talk about the first part, and then um, the other slides are for the second part. So. This is a clip from WGBH's uh, Vietnam series. It was filmed in 1981 on the road from the Hue Phubai Airport into Hue, and it is a panorama of what used to be Camp Eagle. This was the 100 Air Force, 101st Airborne Division's uh, camp, really operated from 1968 to 72. And, um, and what you're seeing is six years later, the residual detritus and debris that's left uh, from this. And the US forces pulled out in about uh, one month. They went from 15,000 troops to about uh, 400 uh, caretakers. 
And um, what interests me in this project on militarized landscape is really thinking about the scale of the military occupation in Vietnam. We hear a lot about the bombing, uh, intense bombing in a very small area. But the question I had is really, how does a country recover from this kind of, of military footprint? And, and, and that's where the term footprints of war comes from. It's sort of thinking about that. Um, and theoretically, I'm, I'm very much inspired by a kind of dialectical approach to military footprints and militarization. And I found the work of Henri Lefebvre, who is completely incomprehensible, um, but wonderful nonetheless, uh, very interesting. And in he talks about his native Paris, and he talks about a certain dialectic in urban spaces between representational spaces, practice, spaces of practice, sort of physical creations. And, um, and how these interact. And he, he's basically talking about a certain agency of, of space. And I, I, I try to apply that in my book to, a, to militarized spaces. And the sort of question that really drives this book is, is thinking about militarized spaces as having a, a, a kind of agency on development, on uh, post-war. Um, but as I began to study these places, I began to realize that in fact, these same military spaces had been uh, occupied before, and they had been occupied actually by military forces for several centuries. So the book that unfolds is really a long history of militarization. Uh, it's, it's, it's contextualizing the American occupation in a much longer dialogue that Vietnamese people have had with different military forces um, in, in these landscapes. And so I use landscape as a kind of analytical lens to look at these uh, dialectical relationships. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do there. Great, thanks, David. Um, Leah, I, I ask if you can go next, uh, answer the same question. What is your book about? And what do you think are some of your main innovations? And allow me just to unshare the screen briefly. Um. Well, I think um, any book has multiple or origins, um, but one origin story for this book that I'd like to share with you today has to do with these jars of uh, bits of bombs that I brought back from my field studies with explosive clearance teams. And um, at first I started collecting these by accident. I would just find them when I was out walking with um, bomb technicians and they would say, oh, that's a bit of a bomb. <clears throat> and they would examine it and make sure it wasn't explosive. And then I was allowed to take it home with me if I wanted to. So I started collecting these sort of by accident. Um, but it, it slowly became this kind of paranoid process where every time I saw a bit of metal on the ground, I would think to myself, is that part of a bomb? And there was one time when I was out with a bomb technician in a village and we found um, this piece of metal here, which you can't quite see, but I'll tell you about it in my story. Uh, found this piece of metal in a village and she looks at it and she says, oh, this is part of a rocket. And she hands it to me and she says, you can keep it. And I, as I was looking at this piece of metal, I became suspicious because I didn't think it was actually part of a bomb. Um, but she had just told me that it was. And, and so I, I kept on kind of fiddling with this, this item and asking other people to look at it um, and eventually realizing that it wasn't part of a rocket. Um, it was part of a motorcycle engine. And so, in that moment, this, and so I saved it in my bomb collection, even though it's not part of a bomb, <laughs> as a reminder that it's really easy to mistake the war as like the most important or most visible thing that's happening in these battlefields. But that's often not the case, um, that we have to pay attention to the daily lives that are being built on top of or alongside these remains of war, like what David just showed us in this compelling um, archival footage. Um, and so I kept that piece of a 
of a motorcycle engine to remind myself to really honor and pay attention to the lives of the people that are currently living um, in these old battlefields and to not let the war overshadow my, my senses. Um, and so the book in a way is kind of a, um, a larger response to that, what seems to me to be a, a kind of ethical humanist impulse to really respect the lives of the people that are currently living in these zones. Um, that, it, what, that it's like, and I developed this idea of parallelism that it's not that one is more important than the other, but that they, these two experiences, one of war and one of everyday life need to be treated side by side and given equal relevance in, um, in an anthropological or historical analysis. Um, and that's harder <laughs> to do than it sounds. And the book is, is a, a kind of experimental eth ethnography of uh, what that might look like in practice. Yes, and so I look forward to sharing a, a little expert, excerpt later of uh, what, what I imagine that looking like in practice when we get to that. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Leah. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan uh, to talk briefly about what he sees his book being about and what he sees as the main contribution. Um, Jonathan also asked me to share a screen. Um, so one, one moment as I do that. Jonathan, can you see the slide? Um, I can see it, I think we okay. all can. Great. Yeah, so um, this picture is just to give you a little bit of uh, a geographical grounding for where my uh, where the work for this book took place. And this is in the kind of crook of the Seisan River, right where the Vietnam uh, border is um, with Cambodia. Uh, so the, the villages that I was working in are right inside of that border. You can switch forward there, Eric. I just wanted to sort of locate us, but then this next image is just for uh, for you to see a landscape. That's a Swidden landscape up in the hills of Cambodia. And uh, you can immediately see that there's a story of uh, living in the land that the Swidden process, this process of uh, burning, uh, uh, clearing, planting uh, plots of farmland creates in the, in the landscape itself, there's a history of, of living and it's a moving history as the Swidden field itself sort of moves across the landscape. Um, the book, uh, Disturbed Forests, Fragmented Memories, is um, an effort to narrate uh, a series of historical conjunctures that the Jirai people of Northeast Cambodia have experienced uh, from their perspective and from the perspective of the landscape itself. Uh, the idea is that the landscape uh, tells stories. Certainly for the Jirai people, uh, when you are hanging out with them and talking about history, talking about the past, it is always uh, in reference to, to the places that they live, the places that uh, historical events have taken place, and the forests, the rivers, the, the components of the landscape itself play, play a role often, uh, and the spirits that inhabit these places play a role in these stories. They shape the stories. They are, uh, in a way, agentive. They're actors in these stories. Um, and the thrust of the book, the idea is that these stories provide insights into, new insights into regional and world history, that these are subaltern stories uh, histories that uh, reimagine and often contradict uh, conventional narratives about the experience of colonialism, for example, about the Vietnam War, about the Cambodian genocide. Uh, and I note in the book that uh, E.P. Thompson called this kind of account a history from below. And I make the point that this is elevationally inaccurate in the case of the Jirai since they're Highlanders and that we should call these histories from the hills instead. Um, the, there's a theory of landscape uh, underneath, underlying the approach in the book. Um, the landscapes are both uh, observed and lived in, and they bring together uh, at least three fields of inquiry that have been important to anthropologists and historians and geographers, um, ecology, representation, and materiality. Right, so the landscape, uh, by focusing on landscape, we're able to uh, look at the actual, the actual ecology of the, 
that people live in, uh, and that this could be in an urban setting as well as in uh, a setting like the Jirai uh, Hill Country, um, there's a representational dimension to landscape. Landscapes are imbued with meanings through the processes of being lived in. Uh, and they, at the same time, there's uh, an opening here for understanding them in their, the, material, the materiality of the landscape and also in the way that it, that it is active in, in the social world of the people who, who inhabit it. Um, I wanted to make, there's one more point that I, I, it was interesting. I was trying to find the point where I must have written this down in the introduction of my book, uh, the role of uh, thinking with uh, conjuncture in putting together a, uh, an understanding of how we might look at these landscapes of, of all of this region. Um, and I realized, of course, that I just completely subsumed this uh, critical point within myself and it had it comes out in all of the different pieces of the book, but is never explicit. Uh, when this is this notion, um, I was really interested in the way that scholars like uh, Tanya Lee uh, and uh, talks, Tanya Lee talks about the um, conjunctural analysis in her book, Land's End. Uh, and other scholars also, uh, Nancy Peluso has a, a great article that uses the uh, concept of conjuncture as an insight, as a way of getting insight into uh, historical processes, and of course they're borrowing from Stuart Hall and Doreen Massey and others. Um, and the idea here is that people live in, in conversation with the landscape that they inhabit, that they are constantly interacting with it. And those interactions are shaped by the, uh, the set of political and economic forces that are operating at a given moment. And these change over time uh, very abruptly. So even though it may seem like there's this sort of story of resilient Sweden farming up in the hills, when you really talk to people up there about what their experience has been of the past, you see that they've changed their agricultural system and their way of interacting with their environment, or they've had it changed on them very rapidly over the course of these different historical periods so that what they were doing during the colonial period and their relationship with the landscape had salient features during the, say, the moment from 1952 or three, whenever it was that uh, Cambodia gained independence, uh, it changes again with the arrival of the, the uh, Khmer Rouge, et cetera, right? Um, and it's not a surprise that the landscape then records and takes on elements of this history that it expresses the historical conjuncture that it is formed during. And these expressions live on uh, after that moment has passed and serve uh, as ways into the past, uh, but only in a partial way, right? Because they are constantly being, the, the ecologies are constantly being reworked. So this is this notion of the disturbance uh, but also the disturbed force and fragmented histories that these histories are never complete. They are always, uh, they are all, always partial. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic, Jonathan. Um, so thanks to all three of you for sharing a kind of inter introductory uh, window into these three fantastic manuscripts. Um, a couple of things. Uh, Later, I, I will want to ask you a question about this idea of reading the landscape as a historical archive, because I think that's something that all three of you can talk, talk about, uh, but I'll save that question for later. Um, I want to turn to something that Leah mentioned in passing when she was introducing her book. She used the term ethical humanist impulse. And one of the things um, that's uh, very evident in all three of your books is a deep attention to the writerly practice, narrative and storytelling and bringing in the story of a landscape with actual narrative strategies in the writing of your texts themselves, um, which I, I see is entangled with that ethical humanist impulse. Um, so what I'd like to do now is ask each of you to pick a, a passage or, or a story. You can either read from the book or tell, retell a story in your own words from, from the book itself as a way to kind of give a window to our audience into your approach, uh, your writerly approach to addressing this. Um, I'll start with Leah. Thank you, Eric. Um, <clears throat> well, for my 
the section I want to share with with you today is the the opening section of the book, which is a place where I try to to lay out narratively um, this concept of parallelism and what it looks like in the ethnographic record. And then I'll share a poem that I wrote based off of um, a similar encounter. The Fruit Eaters. <clears throat> Before becoming a bomb technician, an interlocutor of mine served as a monk for seen years at a Theravada Buddhist temple in Vientiane, the capital of Laos. After his workday at the office of an explosives clearance operator that is hosting my research, he invites me to ride with him on his motorbike to visit his former temple, Wat Sok Padwang, on the outskirts of town. Wat Sok Padwang is a forest temple originally situated in the jungle outside the city walls, though in recent decades it has been encompassed by urban sprawl. The temple maintains expansive for it is forested grounds circumnavigated by a white gilded wall. Leaving our motorbike against the wall, we enter by foot under a large lavishly painted archway of entwined dragons. As we cross into the forested interior, the sound of the nearby thoroughfare is smothered by the vestigial forest preserved within the temple grounds, an underbrush of flowering ginger and medicinal herbs, plus large trees whose trunks host pale lichens, wax-leaved bromeliads, ferns, and trailing gray lianas. When we ar arrive at the central plaza next to the Sim, the most sacred central building, a ceremony, a cremation is underway. The relatives and guests have left. Only two silent novices remain to tend the giant kiln. They kindle the fire with long sticks, producing snapping crackles that seem only to deepen the silence in the plaza. The air is suffused with blue smoke and the thick smell of incense. The coffin has already collapsed upon itself and the body is no longer visible within the flames. Wreaths and other flowering decorations smoke, their green moisture resisting the cremation. We stay at the border of the plaza and watch the flame slowly diminish, the corpse and the flowers. In this quiet zone of mortal reflection, my companion tells me a strange, brief war story he heard while he was a monk at this temple. He told this story in the present tense as he first heard it and as I tell it here. Two American soldiers are flying a helicopter low over the jungles of Laos, scouting for villages during the Vietnam-American War. They are looking for possible communist hideouts, sites where rebels built camps or were hosted by existing villages. Skimming the treetops, one soldier sees very clearly a village below, grass huts on stilts, dirt-worn paths through the green fields, people walking with baskets of fruit strapped to their backs. He signals a landing nearby, but once they are on the ground, there is no village to be found. After giving up the search and reboarding their helicopter, the two soldiers keep watch out of the vehicle's windows. Neither one sees a village. The village and its inhabitants disappeared. In response to my perplexed expression, my interlocutor explains, there are worlds around us that we can't see full of people who are right and honest and only eat fruit. They never kill anything. These worlds exist parallel to the present realm, other realms, other heavens and hells. My interlocutor spreads his arms wide and sweeps them around while wriggling his fingers as if to touch the stuff of these many worlds all around us invisible. The world that the soldiers glimpsed in the war story is known as the realm of the fruit eaters, it is a special paradise inhabited by merit-filled beings who never kill anything to sustain themselves. They only eat fruit that has fallen freely from wild trees. This kind of food is free from the negative karma of slaughtering animals or destroying plants. It is a realm without butchers, meat eaters, murderers, executioners, or soldiers. As a result of the virtuous habits of the residents, the realm of the fruit eaters is peaceful and all the beings who reside there are healthy and happy. Only especially morally correct beings are reincarnated as fruit eaters. By comparison, the immoral actions of the inhabitants of our world are creating a state of near perpetual war, violence and suffering. 
my interlocutor explains that the Vietnam American War made the boundaries between these parallel worlds porous. And so in the midst of war, one American soldier glimpses a Lao paradise free of violence. So that's the opening of my book um, written in the present tense in the same tense that my companion told me this war story. And uh, later on, um, I was reminded of the fruit eaters while doing field work with a bomb clearance squad uh, when one of the technicians told me that she remembered the different kinds of bombs because they all looked like different kinds of fruit. And she had fruit names for all of the different kinds of bombs. Um, and in response to that, I wrote a poem um, called The Fruit Eaters, which I'll also share with you. <clears throat> The exceedingly virtuous eat only fruit that freely falls without knowledge of death. She forages from the forest, cucumber bombs, guava bombs, bale bombs, pineapple bombs, melon bombs. Quote, sometimes I wonder if they are supposed to look like fruit so that we will pick them up. She holds a yellow bomb the size of her fist with fins like the blades of pineapples. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. I hesitate to, to interrupt. I, I want everyone to just pause in, on, on the sound of that final poem. Now let's take a moment um, and turn over to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, did you want me to share your slides again? I, I know you had a few more maybe for this scene. You know, we talked about this. Um, I think it's fine not to. I okay. um, I think I thought if, if people were sharing slides, I'd share slides, but no worries. Um, okay, I'm going to read just a section from. It's, it's my turn, yeah, Eric. So, uh, uh, yeah. sorry. Here, I'll just read a section um, from the book called "Forest of the Dead." Um, during this visit to my friend Twix's um, farm, uh, just to note, I, I refer to him as Jiang in the as a form of address, and this reflects a, uh, an alliance that we've consecrated between the two of us. So, uh, I went to visit Kasor Twek at his farm on the Ya Bla to the east of the village where the mountains of Vietnam loom off in the distance. Twek and his neighbors have cut their fields from a broad expanse of forest. Here the farmland slopes gradually up from the stream and ends in a fringe of trees and scrub at the top of the ridge. Between the stream and the forest's edge, all has been cleared and planted. Low-lying cashews at the bottom of the hill, sesame, tobacco, maize, and rice in the more recently created fields towards the top. All has been cleared, that is, except for a shock of trees that juts out in the midst of Twek's farm field, a 400 square foot stand of forest in the middle of acres of farmland. The day I arrived, I found Twek working the edges of that anomalous cluster of trees. He stood shirtless and covered in sweat, a bush knife in his hand, his torso streaked black where the charred branches he carried had marked him. He was clearing brush from the edge of the copse, removing it to small piles that he had set alight. And, that, and as those piles burned all around, he assessed the copse's edge and sighed, exasperated or perhaps it was a kind of mock exas exasperation. This was common with Twick, that he would laugh about his predicament, not with irony, but with complete sincerity. Oh, Jiang, I addressed him as I walked up. He smiled, happy to see me. You look frustrated, what's the matter? He sighed again, still smiling as he looked from burning piles to the shaggy forest. The dead, he said, it's the dead, Jiang. It's not just, the spirits known as Yang, who inhabit the forests of the Northeast Hills, but also Atao, the dead who live there. Villages produce dead people, and the living bury the dead in the forest at the village's edge. Thereupon, those forests may no longer be cut. They must be left to grow freely. This is why one finds funerary statues under the tallest patches of forest in areas where villages once stood. When a village site is abandoned, the village burial ground becomes its own forest type, a forest of the dead, a glai atau. This is an ecological formation and a social world at the same time, a forest animated not just by memory, but by human presences too. 
It was just such a socio-ecological formation that Tweck was dealing with here in the middle of his agricultural lands where the forest of the dead was shading out his crops and taking up space he might otherwise use for farming. Tweck told me there were jars and statues and tombs inside the darkness under those trees. He invited me to enter the copse and poke around. No harm would come to me. So I did. Just past the tangled edge where vines and shrubbery crowded the light, I found a decaying statue that resembled the antennae of an insect or perhaps elephant tusks, a familiar funerary form, and large shreds of ceramic jars emerging from the ground where they had been once been placed at the head of a tomb. It was a graveyard, but whose? So the intervening couple of pages, uh, Twek and his uh, wife, Mon, uh, tell me the story of whose graves those are. And this is the story of this village from uh, the Pleiku province in Vietnam, which had come across the river to Cambodia to flee the Rolling Thunder bombing uh, campaign. And um, uh, the, uh, the series of uh, bombings that was taking place in, in just across the river at that time. And uh, so by, uh, so what happens is that this village actually seeks shelter with, uh, with the villagers of Tankadon, who they have some uh, relations with, some kin relations, and they're granted this place to come and do their farming. Uh, but at this moment, the American bombing campaign uh, begins in Cambodia and a, a bomb is dropped on uh, the settlement, uh, killing everybody in the settlement. Um, and then uh, the people were, uh, some of the relatives came across and uh, the survivors, uh, what, was, what people were able to find were buried in this site. And I just wanted to um, finish up here with a couple more lines of of where this winds up, because I think you can see a little bit of how the history is worked into the lived experience of the landscape. The scene I encountered in Tweck's field illustrates how the forest as forest and as socio-ecological formation acts upon the world. In his appraisal of, of the edge of the Goliathau in his Swidden field, Tweck used his capabilities as a farmer and as a dry person to consider how he should treat the small cluster of trees it would have been more efficient from the perspective of agricultural productivity to do away completely with the tangled patch of forests and graves. But Tweck did not conceive of the situation in these terms. Rather, he faced a dilemma of what should be burned and what should be left and where the edge should be and how thoroughly he should intervene to balance a set of objectives and requirements as he understood them. There were aesthetic as well as moral questions involved. The landscape should look a certain way. It should include certain plants arranged appropriately in relation to each other. The copse was replete with memory and meaning. It had a representational force in, that acted upon Twek, but it was also animated by the presence of the Atau, the dead who resided in the forest and who required respect. Finally, it was also very much alive. It was growing as it had been since the victims of the American bomb had been buried in the spot. Likewise, of course, Tweck's Swiddenfield was itself alive, both with crops he had planted and with incidental species that were either desired or not desired based on their usefulness. And all the plants themselves furthermore possessed bangat, what we might call souls, and thus at the very least must be understood to have a certain vitality that is in a way comparable with that of humans who also of course have bangat. The multiple vital presences with which Tweck was necessarily required to negotiate make of the landscape not so much a productivity problem to be solved as a set of relationships to be managed and attended to. So it goes on from there. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's, it's amazing uh, to hear ethnography read. Um, it's something we often don't give ourselves the opportunity to do, and that's quite powerful ethnography you've written there. Um, let me turn it over to David Biggs for the last section of this. And then after that, I just wanna encourage people to start formulating questions because we'll open it up to the audience for questions after that. Go ahead, David. Thanks, Eric. And um, for mine, if you can share the screen, I've got a slide, the third slide there. That'd be good. It'll help people understand where we are. So uh, I'm going to read a passage. Um, I, I'm, I hope it's not 
I, I don't know. It's not as it's not as ethnographic. So I hope you'll bear with me. But it's a very important story, um, in the sense for uh, one before that. So it's a very important story for really reading um, very famous um, military events. And I think everybody on the call knows that in 1968, the Tet Offensive, uh, the Battle of Hue was a sort of surprise attack on the city of Hue. It's often retold in so many different ways, so many different movies, I think uh, Full Metal Jacket and all these other Hollywood stories. All Americans know the story. And what's so amazing to me is that they don't know that this wasn't the first Tet Offensive in Hue. In fact, this was the second or even the third in a sense, and that French troops uh, land on these beaches in 1883, um, but that's that's in the summer. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you a story because I, I think it's very important when we talk about militarization to work against presentist bias, uh, and especially writing in English, most Anglophone readers uh, are very familiar with the most recent war, but we have a tendency to forget about the, the, the earlier layers. And again, if we talk about the agency of militarized landscapes, in a sense, militarization as a set of processes from one era bleeds into subsequent eras. So I wanna read this section uh, from my book in chapter three uh, about the first Tet Offensive. And I wanna read it in part so you might understand why it was, how it was that two battalions of soldiers were able to, um, to secretly put themselves in the city and rise up in 1968. And I think when you have this first Tet Offensive, it might give you some context. Um, right, so fighting between Viet Minh and French forces began on December 19th, 1946 in Haiphong and a destructive French naval invasion at Hue commenced a month later, spurring thousands of young people to retreat from lowland defenses to the tactical zones. In the months leading up to the invasion, the Viet Minh urged its followers to dig tunnels, trenches, and barricades. In the city of Hue and in nearby villages, several thousand youth dug defensive positions with bomb shelters and tunnels. Upon receiving word about the fighting at Haiphong, Viet Minh units in Hue blew all the bridges along Highway 1. Viet Minh troops in Hue attacked about 800 outnumbered but well-armed French troops at the Marin Hotel and other government buildings in the French Quarter. Unlike the naval assault in 1883, this military landing met fierce resistance from the landing beaches to the streets of Hue. Launched just five days before the start of the Lunar New Year, this 1947 Tet Offensive resulted in high numbers of civilian casualties and left sections of the town in ruins. French Marines, most of them from French Africa, brought naval artillery and heavy weapons against lightly armed but dug in Viet Minh. Viet Minh forces had governed Hue for over a year after the August Revolution, and even after the return of French soldiers, they commanded a military regiment and enjoyed strong support in the villages. Their units engaged French forces invading by sea at two inlets, Tu Hien and Tuan An. French forces landed on the beachheads and took high casualties. One group, a few thousand troops with armored cars loaded on American-made military landing craft surplused after World War II, unloaded at the banks of the lagoon at Druy, within a few hundred meters of Highway 1. The other group landed at Twin An Beach with armored vehicles to attack way from the north. In contrast to the French naval landing in 1883, the forces in 1947 met sustained resistance from the beach to the city. The Southern group required 19 days to travel 30 kilometers on Highway 1 from Trui before meeting the other group in Hue. From Hue and Fubai, French forces spent the next month reoccupying key military installations, finding them emptied with all supplies removed. As the French troops secured positions along Highway 1, they destroyed village communal houses at Yale and Fubai, and they set up command posts at some of the region's most sacred sites. One of them, was Nam Yao Pavilion on the southern edge of Hue. Nam Yao included pine groves and a pavilion that hosted the annual rites the emperor performed to bring prosperity and good harvest to the kingdom. The profaning of the site with French troops and military equipment, especially bombs, gave a clear visual sign of the French position vis-a-vis -vis the recently abdicated head of state, Bao Dai. On the edge of the French quarter in the, the deforested spaces of Nam Zhao, 
the French military established its Nord Anam Way sector. So this is an example of a symbolic attack on this landscape. After French forces broke the Viet Minh defense, Viet Minh units retreated to tactical zones. Over the next several years, this move uphill, Zhu Tu, facilitated profound territorial and personal transformations, especially for thousands of Vietnamese youth. The political and military leaders of the Viet Minh had regrouped with their families at Hoa Mi for more than a year since 1946. The Trung Cao Van Regiment's three battalions retreated here and formed a company of commandos to continue guerrilla missions into the city. After the French invasion in the summer of 1947, more army units and larger communities so soldiers and their families continued the exodus, expanding tunnel networks into the mountains and digging bunkers and underground caches. The province committee anticipated that French occupation forces would force youths in the lowlands to serve with the occupation military. So it built tactical zones as spaces for removing young men from their mid-teens to late 30s from villages along Highway 1. They established routes of communication, trails, and secret codes to guide youth volunteers into the war zones, opening paths for escape and for guerrilla teams to return. And so those red dots you see, those are the first four of those tactical zones that were created, up, created on those rivers. While most histories focus on the tactical elements of these zones, a Hung Tui district account of the resistance captures some glimpses of the tolls on families in occupied villages whose sons and daughters had gone uphill. Resistance zones were difficult places to survive, even without enemy attacks. Mosquitoes carried malaria and Viet Minh field hospitals were lucky to have quinine as a preventative medicine. Young women with limited training as nurses regularly risked search, detention, and torture for carrying medicine from towns such as Hue into these rebels areas. One doctor left a prosperous practice in Hue to carry medical supplies to the field hospital at the Khe Chai base. The tactical zones fostered deep emotional connections linking people from different lowland villages with each camp. A district history describes this yearning for relatives, quote, the tactical zone was a place of much longing, excitement for reunions and deep compassion. Here was a basis for understanding the preciousness of life. In the afternoon, the people of Fu Vang and Hung Tui districts look from their homes in the countryside to the tactical zones in the hills, remembering those working there in service, transport, communication, logistics, remembering their first trips into the tactical zones." Quote. As the resistance continued for seven years, those emotional ties and the traffic in and out of the region helped forge new trails and webs of local networks through which the Viet Minh national vision extended across more of the central coast's rugged terrain. And now, Eric, if you can go to the next slide real quick. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so this is a close up of that place, Hua Mi. And the point I'm trying to make here is that this earlier layer of military conflict, it didn't, it wasn't just tactical and moving on the land, but it actually created new social relationships and it created new interactions, new symbolic under, connections with this landscape. You see in the upper right corner of this map on the right, uh, that's Highway 1 and the railroad just north of Way. Uh, that's the street without joy that Bernard Fall writes about. And this is uh, a place called Hua Mi. And what's so interesting, if you read this map closely, you can see the names of the hilltops to the right. And the hilltops to the right have all been cleared. They have an N. The letter N means Nui. And if you look to the left, however, this is another French map. This is a topographic map uh, drawn and then reproduced in 1952 by the US Army Mapping Service for the French. Uh, you see the UTM grid, this purple grid that's overlaid. Uh, that's a, a World War II military grid system the Americans use and the Allies use, and that was used for call, calling in bombing coordinates. Um, the, but, but what's really interesting are the ridge names on the left. You see a transition from the word Nui to a word Gulp and a word Dom. And Gulp and Dom signify not ethnically Vietnamese hilltops. And so, so this gateway 
that is an important tactical zone for the Viet Minh youth is also a really important cultural gateway. It's, it's the place in which so many of these youth entered into these trails that then moved further west and north up to the battle zones in the north of Vietnam during the French Indochina War. And so there's a very important kind of spatial practice that is happening in 1947 for these youth. Many of them get relocated after 1954 as combatants to Tan Hoa. They become part of some Hue area central Vietnamese regiments in the People's Army of Vietnam. And again, what's interesting is that by 1966, some of these regimental units are back in this area. And so one of the points I try and make in my, my book is that we have, if we take a deeper study of militarization in, in these particularly militarized spaces, we can better understand how different groups of combatants move through these spaces and how they understand them. And I think that applies not just to Vietnam, it applies to Afghanistan, to, um, the, um, to Iraq and to desert areas and other parts of the world. And I think it's that presentist bias that is really missing. Um, I do have one last story to share, um, but I'm not sure if I have time. Eric? David, you, you can share your story. Okay, thanks. Um, it, it's towards the end of the book, and it's this final kind of epilogue chapter. If you can go to the next slide. Oh, and uh, I'll say one more thing about this place, Hua Mi. So Hua Mi was so symbolically important for the Viet Minh. It was also very symbolically important for the Hue family, the Ziem, uh, Moden Ziem family and his family, uh, that when they got American aid money to develop these new strategic hamlets and things like that, the first place they picked to send the bulldozers was Hua Mi. Uh, they, they wanted to relocate people there, not because it was a great place for agriculture, but because symbolically it was a way to level and erase the important foothold that the Viet Minh had established in this place. So Americans had no clue, but these local actors knew exactly symbolically why they were doing that. Okay, so this is the last one, and this gets back to this this base footprint, this former uh, military base, which now is a, a very large industrial area, industrial park. Um, and uh, this, this uh, centers on an interview that I did with a uh, former village head on the village bordering this base. Some of the village lands, especially the village cemetery, uh, was taken for Camp Eagle. And you have actually have pictures of US troops and their barracks situated among Vietnamese tombs. And uh, the Marines, when they first used this area, called it LZ Tombstone because the landing zone was set amid the tombstones. Can you imagine what an awful place that was, you know, to fight a war? Anyway, um, this is about what to do after the war. And this is a discussion with this man, Mr. Fug. And he said, um, well, I, I talk about the decision about what vestiges to keep or let go is a complex one with many parallels around the world. Landscapes are often at the center of debates involving veterans and national history. Walls pockmarked by shrapnel or metal skeletons of tanks and down planes often serve as focal points for state guided reflection. Proponents of memorialization seek such ruined monuments so that people will never forget, while others seek to erase these old war vestiges to move on. Communities are often divided too in trying to balance the desires of veterans and the younger generation. Mr. Fung, a resident of Yatle village who fought with the 324th Regiment, that's one of those central Vietnamese regiments that moved north, described to me as shock after 1975 when the one-time cityscape of Camp Eagle looking like, quote, looking like New York, bright lights like crazy, turned into an empty wasteland that you see here. A native of the village and a political officer, he returned to the village and hoped to preserve parts of Camp Eagle as a museum, while also salvaging some of the metal siding to build his house. He went north to Hanoi for training, and uh, when he returned, the tanks were all gone. He said, they cleared the hills so that several years later, there was nothing left. Before, when I looked from this place out, it was New York City, but then they cleared it and left it empty. I returned and just farmed. My house was an iron siding house just built. 
At that time, I resolved to preserve one military tank as a reminder. And you see this in some Vietnamese villages, the lone military tank. But then I went to Hanoi to study and the people here, they took it for scrap, removing everything. I'd intended to preserve the American base in Hamlet 5 because I lived near it. I knew to preserve the base intact so that later our children and people could come and visit. But they'd taken and broken up everything. The stuff the Americans left was all destroyed. And so, um, so, so this, this continues this, this debate in Vietnamese society about what to preserve and how to preserve. And of course, it's very political. And it's not only Vietnamese, of course, Americans have very strong feelings about these places too. Um, and, uh, and for example, one American reporter traveled to this site about a year after this film was shot, a guy named Craig Whitney with the New York Times. And he, of course, he reports all that's left is rubble and a few stones. And an American veteran of the 101st Airborne writes in a letter to the editor, he, he says, you know, I must respectfully disagree with this observation that only stones were left where American bases had stood. As a former non-commissioned officer in the 101st, who spent a short but incredibly intense part of my life at Fubai and Camp Eagle, I know with certainty that more is left there than a few stones. Things like honor and comradeship, our former naivete and the blood of ourselves and others in the sand. For those of us who fought there, Fubai and Camp Eagle remain something indelible, a place in our minds and memories, not just places on a map. And so I leave you with that, but I, I think it's important and I, I'm really interested in our conversation today um, to, to think about militarization, not simply in strict physical or presentist terms, but in these sort of deeper layers and meanings. Thank you, David. It, it's actually quite amazing how um, a turn towards the, the landscape, which in some ways seems to be the most material of all things, um, actually brings you back to the immaterial in such a complex way. Um, so, uh, I, and I see that running through all of your, your, your pieces. Um, because of the time, I wanna make sure we get questions from the audience. Um, so before asking any of my own questions, cause I can always follow up with you. I'd like to see if anyone from the audience would like to start us off. Um, I see uh, Michael G. Van followed by Nam Kim. Um, so I'll start with Michael and then follow with Nam Kim. Hi, good morning. Can you see me or hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thanks. Okay, great. Hey, uh, great panel. And one of the things that came to mind um, for me was uh, repurposing of landscape uh, and, and also repurposing of memories. And I know this is the strongest for Vietnam, but also happens in Cambodia and Laos. I was wondering if the panelists could say about something about repurposing these landscape memories of war for commercial tourism particularly a Western market, but also greater Asian tourism. And thank you, great session. I'm happy to um, respond to, to that question. Um, I was just thinking about this this morning in my planning for the session. Um, so there was a, um, um, a man that I studied with uh, in Pulsavan, which is uh, one of the most bombed places on earth. And he, um, his father had been a soldier during the, the American Vietnam War. And his father had learned how to uh, dismantle bombs during that conflict and then had taught his son. And now his son was working in the illegal war scrap trade um, using, because he knew where all the battlefields were because of his dad's um, involvement, going to those battlefields, uh, digging up ordnance and then selling them on the black market. And he also had a, um, a tourism company where he would take people around on tours of these old battlefields. Um, and I think that this, this account is, really compelling because it it highlights for me that the tourism, or at least in my conversations with this man, that the tourism was part of a positive reclaiming of a, a, a traumatic family history, that he was able to transform it into something that helped him and his and his kin um, to give it value. 
That was the sense I had from this man and my conversations with this man. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of super critical things that one could say about war tourism, but this was an example in which it felt very positive. <laughs> I, I could add just a little bit. I, I went over, so I'm gonna stay quiet, except that um, one of the problems in studying these places is that the Vietnamese military on the coast is still very actively engaged in some of them. And the other problem has to do with Vietnam's ongoing st stress with China and its military relations with the United States. Um, so in people that I talked to, they were very careful because they didn't really know what were the political valences of talking about American war destruction given American arms sales to Vietnam. It's so political. Um, I think that's really stalled it. I, I don't have too much to say about tourism, except um, it's interesting the way that it foreshortens um, uh, the historical processes. Um, you know, in Cambodia, uh, the the Khmer Rouge have only just left Phnom Penh uh, every single day. It was just yesterday, right? So tourists show up and hang out at um, at uh, these uh, cafes and watch Apocalypse Now, and right. And there's no there's no sense for. I mean, it's interesting the sort of ways that these things distort history as opposed to uh, placing the places that they are uh, visiting within history. So. Um, it's not something I've looked at, but I did have a tourist uh, wander by um, uh, this, uh, this longhouse that I was doing a recording in uh, one time. So I think that they probably went home with this wonderful story of how they'd gotten so authentically into Cambodia that they actually found an anthropologist at work up in the hills, right? Uh, I thought that was quite, quite, a, quite a funny encounter. So anyway. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to turn to Nam Kim, who's an archaeologist from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, also, great experience in war landscapes, but in the archaeological record. Go ahead, Nam. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, many thanks, Eric, and, and the esteemed panelists for a fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I have a couple of comments and, and then a couple of questions I'm hoping the panelists might uh, engage with. Um, each of the panelists gives us a very powerful reminder about how the past and purported ownership of that past can be tied to physical pieces of terrain and artifacts. Um, I found particularly fascinating uh, Leo Zani's example of that piece of motorcycle being presented as a fragment of the war or of a war. Um, and it's reminiscent of how many communities produce counterfeit artifacts purportedly from the ancient world for various agendas and for profit. Um, I also appreciated David's uh, assertion about this presentist bias and how we need to consider the layers of warfare and conflict history that interdigitate and become embedded in these physical spaces. Uh, my own work at, at the site of Goloa in, in Vietnam illustrates how conflict can leave these kinds of scars on the environment and on terrain over millennia. Um, some of those ramparts that were constructed over 2000 years ago during the 20th century, soldiers dug slit trenches and bunkers right into them and it gives us a kind of illustration of how a space is militarized through the course of longer terms of history. Uh, so related to these comments, I, I'm interested to see how our panelists might view these kinds of ethical questions about ownership and presentation of that past, given different stakeholders. Um, who says what should be preserved, how it should be preserved, how we develop narratives around those remains, how these landscapes might be considered sacred or significant as spaces of commemoration, maybe even on a national level. Um, so essentially in your experiences, how do communities at both the local and national levels work together to determine how these spaces are explained, commemorated or exhibited? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I, I I think, you know, one thing that struck me in talking about tourism is that the really popular form of tourism in these villages and in these sites is actually a kind of funerary tourism. Um, you see it in the building of ancestral shrines. Um, you see it in state-sponsored um, efforts to recognize the dead and to placate the wandering ghosts. Um, 
And, and I think this is really interesting in, in a local context, the, how different it might be, say, in the American West, at places like Wounded Knee, you know, and, and other sites like that, or the lynching sites in, in Mississippi, where you have this extreme violence. Um, and, and I think that in Vietnam, the discussions about commemoration, both on the national and the local level, are really much moving in parallel with those discussions, say, in the American West and the American South about how do you respectfully, you know, preserve this, this kind of, of, of really deep, horrible violence without somehow reproducing it or <laughs> or celebrating it, you know, or, or somehow demeaning it. And, that, and that, that's very, very hard. Um, I might just comment that uh, this question of what kinds of uh, presentation of the past are authorized or uh, in what ways might the past be that landscapes be incorporated into these practices of commemoration. Um, this is one of the um, sort of enduring themes of um, much writing about Southeast Asia and, and it's certainly about the, uh, the post-war in, in the uh, mainland Southeast Asia. Um, it goes back to Ben Anderson, for instance, on official nationalisms, right? This idea that there are these nationalisms that threaten the, the order, and then there are these efforts to impose uh, official versions of national pasts that would uh, be amenable to uh, the, the, those um, to projects of rule, I suppose. Um, and the, that shows up in a sort of different way in Hannah Kwan's um, Ghosts of War, right? That there are certain, that there are certain figures from the past that, that are uh, worthy of national remembrance and then you have these from below processes again that um, that same font of memory that same font of um, looking to the past for uh, confirmation of for bolstering present day purposes uh, can be sort of tapped into for for a variety of, of uh, different sort of approaches to uh, or that is to say that commemoration serves different political agendas, different, um, different agendas relating to identity and uh, belonging in the present. Um, and that's the case for, for landscapes as well, right? So I think that's part of the reason why uh, I was trying to suggest in, in uh, my book, for instance, that um, there are, that this notion of history from the hills, that they, this provides alternative readings of the past and the fact that it's accessible through the places that one would walk through, right? That one can actually inhabit uh, versions of the past that speak to your present day reality. I think that these these are kinds of these are the kinds of um, ways. I think that if we were to try to look at um, the your question from the perspective of the people who are living in these landscapes, you might you might start getting towards uh, some of these kinds of approaches to what those landscapes mean. Um, I think that David and Jonathan have done an excellent job of responding to um, the larger social implications of, of Nam's question. So I, I would like to, re to respond to the, his comment about interdigitation, which is a great word. <laughs> um, um, because, uh, and, and I, I talk about this in the one, one of the chapters in my book about the gold mine, where, um, these heavily contaminated parts of Laos are uh, shared areas of interests for archeologists, gold miners and bomb clearance. They, sh they share the same soil as their zone of, of intervention. And all three of these pro professional people are kind of intertrained. So for example, at the gold mine um, that I studied, the gold miners are trained to identify um, possible explosive ordnance, which they will dig up with the gold and also archeological evidence, which they will also dig up with the gold. Um, and clearance technicians are also trained 
to identify possible uh, archaeological artifacts, and they treat them in much the same way that they would treat a bomb, that it, it is subject to the same kind of careful attention and like very, you know, with the hands, carefully digging it up. Um, and so there's a just a really interesting um, interdigitation of those three practices in these contaminated areas. Um, and that this is not just an accident that um, it's the, the war uh, has this, this, this ancillary effect of preserving certain areas, making it very difficult for people to develop those zones. And so they then become sort of um, resource preserves. And that's one of the reasons that Laos was targeted um, by this, this multinational gold mine company, because it, Laos's gold reserves had been preserved by the war uh, and not, it had been too dangerous to mine in Laos for several decades. And the same thing goes for its archeological artifacts as well. Um, so thinking about not only how are these processes interdigitated for practitioners, for the, a bomb clearance technician who's also on the lookout for archeological artifacts, but what historical processes lead to that interdigitation over time and how militarism is one of the forces that causes these things to, uh, to mix. Can I can I can I add one little piece to this? Um, your your comments lay remind me that um, there's also a dimension to preservation and excavation here on these sites um, that is a tension between local communities and the state and Vietnamese communities, even patriotic communities who who served on the winning side often are in really strong tension with the state because state actors and provincial level actors um, they have looked at other examples of militarized spaces like in Germany after World War II and and, and there's a there's a certain global dialogue about what to do about so-called ruined spaces both in terms of exhuming bodies commemorations how to appropriately do that the legal ramifications but also the 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 sort of socioeconomic transformations and you know, the interesting thing about these base footprints in Vietnam is that the base footprints are still there. They're now industrial export zones, the same sewer lines, electric grids, streets. And in a sense, they took the uh, historic 1960s base architecture, which sometimes was sitting on earlier levels, and they just kept it as an industrial park. So the villages never got the land back. And so a lot of people in the villages are still mad about the land that was taken maybe by the US Army in 1964, that's now occupied by the provincial industrial park. So there's, there's some interesting actors involved and, the, and it's not the war so much that's so political in central Vietnam, it's the land and the land values and the real estate and who owns it, and who benefits from it. That is in a sense, the difficult thing about exploring these places. You know, I just jump in too, because there's been some comments or people have been asking about the sort of, it's all rubble and ruins, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just so interesting how these, um, these objects from the past, as they break down, the narratives around them also break down, right? So that it's this sort of fragmenting, um, pro the memory, as you, you watch the, the, claims on the past are sort of tied to the integrity of the ruins, the landscapes of the past. And so we see in David's example where the, even the lone tank from the village has been broken down into scrap, or you look at Leah's uh, great discussions of the ways that bombs are repurposed and pulled apart, right? Um, and this really ties into uh, if any of you have read this amazing book uh, by Kim Fortune, uh, Adv Advocacy After Bhopal, um, her point is that, you know, that the, the uh, Indian government uh, was very interested to get rid of the narrative, right? Bhopal ended. There was an end to the past. And what these ruins and rubble bring on, right, in this sort of um, uh, Anne Laura, Laura Stoller uh, way, or sort of, if you think about some of the writing about rubble and ruin recently, that, that the 
the breaking down of these pieces of the past is accompanied by a uh, process of trying to delegitimize claims made on the basis of a shared experience of the past, right? That, that there's also a community of, uh, well, Kim Fortune calls it, you know, like a community of voicing the past that is, is under attack from, right? Those who are opposed to whatever the political um, goal of, of bringing out that past is, is all about. So it's just interesting to see how these, um, there's connections among all the different pieces of um, the writings. I think your, your pile of books on your desk, uh, Eric, was absolutely in conversation with each other. So um, that's really, I just find it interesting to see that th these themes are cutting across all of our, our discussions and questions. Thanks everyone for these really many layered uh, responses to provocative questions. Um, I just want to be mindful of the time. It's 1.11. We have until 1.20 before we have to sign off. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Al Lim, a uh, uh, doctoral candidate here at Yale, um, to ask his question. And then after that, if anyone has any questions um, that they're afraid won't have time to get in before the end of our session, feel free to post them to the chat because we're able to save the chat session and then I'll communicate those with, with the authors here today. So let me turn it over to Al. Go ahead, Al. Thank you so much for the presentation. Super, super fascinating. I think I was wondering about the tension um, kind of building on the conversation about the future. So one way to look at it is the difference between um, Zalun and um, Harana. So I think Leah, you wrote about that in, in Lao, there's this tension between progress and development. Um, so how, like, do you, does, like, Lao people feel sometimes they don't have progress in the country? So it's this kind of nationalist dialogue. So I'm wondering, like, just kind of extending this conversation on temporalities, what is the kind of future outlook in, in a certain sense? Um, so past the presentism and, um, and rich kind of historicism, how do we reckon with what's, um, what's going on? And, and I think there's talk about land value and stuff like that. Just, yeah, we'd love to hear a little more and maybe just potential speculation between the different, is there something distinct about the forest as opposed to the bomb landscape, as opposed to the ruins of the militarized zones that's kind of different and distinct from each other, just kind of across the different, um, yeah, <laughs> just uh, wondering. Thank you. I think that what stood out to be most in my research about Patana was that just like pretty much everybody across the board didn't think it was possible in Laos. And I think that that's a really important, I think that that's really important ethnographically for, that seems to me to just be an incredibly important evidence of like what widespread militarism does to a people's own impression of their possibility for, for a future, for a positive future that, um, that people have, because you know, I'd, I'd hear it all the time, like, oh, Laos doesn't have the ability to do that. We just, they could do that in Thailand, but we just can't do it here. <laughs> and um, it, and, and I, in talking to, to other people, I, it, it was like a sort of catchphrase. You just, it was just so common to hear comments like this, like, oh, we can't, we just, we're just not capable of it here. Um, and, you know, if you, if I push someone like, okay, well, why, why would it be possible to have development in, Cambodia, but not in Laos. Um, people would give all sorts of different answers, but I think the, the thread that runs through all of them is this pervasive sense that Laos is somehow kind of like a bucket with a hole in it. Like it's just, it doesn't matter how much water you put in the bucket, it's all going to fall out. And that was not like a, the specific topic of my study, but I do think that that's a really important feeling that is definitely related to being targeted for a decade of covert warfare, of massive covert warfare that has never been adequately dealt with or acknowledged um, by either the Lao government or the American government. I'll, I'll attempt a response. Um, yeah, I'm. <laughs> I think part of what I've tried to do in my book is to lay out a method. I'm not sure how successful it is, but a method for understanding how people in a place like Vietnam who have an understanding of history, family history, place history that goes back at least 400 years, if not an imagined history that goes back longer, um, 
how they experience conflict like the Vietnam War in the 60s. And, and my point is, and though I, maybe I should have revised it before I published the book, is that it's fundamentally different from Americans who are fighting after World War II in these places, who see it as a technical spot, you know, a thing on a map, an improvised base city, and then they're gone and they leave it, you know, except for the veterans who still have the trauma of it. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the, the way that people develop, the way development is understood in Vietnam is a kind of schizophrenic experience in the sense, and I'm thinking about vast acacia Augustifolia plantations across the hills now. It used to be barren and you could see all the old base front footprints. Now they're all covered up with pulp and paper plantations. And uh, the people who work in those places, um, you know, the, the people who work in it, um, they know the history. And when they're working in those places too, they're, they're very much somehow working through that history at the same time that they're doing something new. And I think there's an understanding that part of your existence in, in a place like in anywhere in Indochina and most of Southeast Asia is in a sense defined by reconciling with this deeper past and these deeper legacies and the ghosts around you and the present sort of you know churn of you know earning a living working and, and it's it's just a really different experience and, that, and that's what i'm trying to convey in the book in the sense that if you read this book you'll maybe get a little better understanding of how a vietnamese combatant might have felt or somebody in the tet offensive might have felt you know in this place it's not just one layer but it's it's deeper I guess I'll try to jump in. I, it sounds like our Zoom is going to blow up in three minutes, Eric, is that correct? <laughs> it, it won't blow up, but uh, we will have to close the session at that time. Okay. Uh, well, this uh, question of the tension between progress and development that, uh, that Al raised. Um, you know, when I set out to do field work, there was this uh, narrative in this sort of development studies literature that development as a project was future oriented, right? So uh, if you think about the uh, book Rule of Experts by Tim Mitchell, right? Uh, Jim Scott's notion of high modernism. The idea was that uh, the imaginations of planners uh, were all about imposing the will of the state on the people through an imagination of a techno technologically superior advanced future. Um, and the question that I actually had going into the field had to do with the ways in which arguments about development in Cambodia are really arguments about the past, um, about what the past authorizes. And in that case, landscape, certainly for the Jirai uh, and for many people in Cambodia, the landscape that they live in, it, it provides the material with which to make claims on the past, right? Because the world that we live in is formed by a traumatic history of some sort, a traumatic history that has a hard time moving back into the past because of its utility in the present. So that even today, the first line of every development project document in Cambodia has to do with the, 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 the rupture of history that was created during the Khmer Rouge period. That's enough for me. Thanks everyone. Um, we're basically at the end of our time here. Um, and I, so I'll just bring this to a close. I, I just wanna pause for a moment and say what a wonderful panel and discussion this really was. Um, getting a lot of messages through the chat, thanking us for organizing this, but I, I really wanna, on behalf of the Council of Southeast Asian Studies, I wanna thank all of you first for writing such wonderful, eloquent, and important books, and also for um, answering the call to come together as a panel. And I, I will suggest, I think that, there, that further dialogue amongst you um, certainly seems fruitful. There's a lot of people who find this discussion interesting. So I hope that um, this small panel could have been a spark that starts a longer conversation. Um, normally, a new, if this was held in New Haven, we would all join each other for lunch at Clark's Diner, um, but Clark's Diner is no longer in existence because of the pandemic. Um, but because we're on virtual Zoom, we can pretend that it still exists. Um, so um, 
And next time you're traveling through the Northeast, I'd like to invite all of you out to lunch uh, to thank you for participating. Anyhow, thank you very much and we'll, we'll see each other again soon. Hi. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and Chris, for organizing and hosting. Yeah. Thanks, yes. everybody. Thanks. Yes. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Jonathan and Leah. Yes. I'm so delighted to have had this excuse to read these two fabulous books. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye, I'm everyone. Say, click bye. the end button. So thanks again. And I'll be in touch with all of you afterwards. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Eric. Bye bye, guys. Bye, bye everyone. Bye.